world. To mark his passing, to celebrate his life, and most of all for Dick and Ruth, to point beyond themselves to the God who loved them graciously, to the Son who died forgivingly, and the one that set them on their journey in love. Six children, Joyce, Lyle, Richard, Lee, Becky, and Barb. All of you, because I come from a big family as well, have common and also individual memories of your mother and your father. It is thus so that each of us experience people in different ways, not because the person is different or treats us differently, but that we take things in differently as God has created us. I remember when my mother died, ten years after my father, as one of four children, there was some strange feeling I had that that generation had passed. The people I had known for my whole life, my mother and my father, were now gone. And it was our generation now that was left on the pilgrimage to go forward. We mark that also in the midst of the church that continues on, even as all the memories flood and flow over us in a time like this. Twelve grandchildren, nineteen great-grandchildren. All who have been marked by the hands and the love of Ruth. Loyalty and kindness and perseverance and most of all, acceptance of strangers is what the book of Ruth is about. And as I prepared for this sermon, I thought, that makes sense to me. Loyalty, kindness, perseverance. Sometimes we Lutherans call perseverance stubbornness. But my mother also, being from Minnesota, also persevered. And acceptance of strangers. Ruth, after all, did not have to go with her mother-in-law to Israel. She could have gone back to her own family as Moabites. But her love of her new family, even in the face of being widowed, was stronger and more loyal than anything else. And she sensed that her mother-in-law needed someone to be with her. Indeed, Ruth has lived out the meaning of her name. I remember on many occasions visiting her when she was still here in Montrose. It was never dull. I always left having learned something new. And she always told me as much time as we had about how the family was. How the kids were doing. And the grandkids. And the great grandkids. You were the light of her life. But she would say that that light stemmed from another called Jesus. She even has an account in a kind of brief biography about having turned 50, or 1950 when she was 29, and had a kind of thing what we call in the church an epiphany. She had an experience that all of us have in one way or another, but we find words pale to somehow describe it. But from that time on, she said, she knew that Jesus would be her best friend 
and he would never leave her. And I thought to myself, she not only heard that from Jesus and lived that out, but she made sure that her friends and all the people who met her along the way knew that she would be there for them as well. She is, as we say in the, in the season of Advent, one among many. Our lights may be different, even different colors. They may have different radiance, different auras. But she is one of those baptized who reflected the light of her life. She always looked beyond herself to those in need, just like her Savior. We all do that in one way or another. Sometimes we are successful and sometimes not so much. And I'm sure she would be the first one to say, sometimes not so much. I remember visiting her when Bernice Stoy lived next door, next door to her at Heidi's. And I would visit Bernice and then I would visit Ruth. Sometimes together, toward the end of Bernice's life, separately, because it was a little too much for her. And Ruth was very concerned about her niece. And her thoughts, even though her shoulder was giving her lots of pain, and her feet were not carrying her as well as they used to, her focus was about her niece and how she was doing. And typically, she came to me at one meeting and said, I wish I could have done more for her niece. And I looked at her and I said, you've done everything. You've loved her. And she knows that. It's not something she read in a book. It's not something <laughs> told her that. It's that you have loved her for who she is and where she is. <coughs> and she started to cry. I said, now, in the church, we would call this your ministry. And of course, she'd stop me mid-sentence and say, oh no, I, I, I know your ministry. That's what you do. And I said, call it what you will. What you do and what you will is to have the same compassion and love for others, especially Bernice, as Jesus has had for the likes of you and me. That made sense to me. I know that I've heard this and probably may not say it in a particular way, but she always bragged about that husband. I remember when he won a bowling And she was the first to tell me about it. Isn't that great? <laughs> Dick mentioned it too. <laughs> <laughs> I have some notes from Angie and Becky. And this one I laughed at <coughs> because I have heard this many times and so have you. Angie writes, after Grandpa's death, Grandma would often repeat something he told her shortly before he died. I don't know how I was so lucky to have such a wonderful wife. <coughs> and I think in all the big ways and all the small ways, that these two found so many years together, starting back in Excelsior, Minnesota, married in 1940, and going through all of that life together, six kids, the ups and downs of depression, of war, of post-war, of growing children, 
of all sorts of challenges that all of us face in one generation or another. Ruth, of course, is not unique, but she is special. Many people have had the same road, the same joys, and the same sorrows that she has. But what is special about Ruth? That sometimes people like me and others look to for strength is that even in the times in which we are challenged and stressed, she found a way to remember, I am always with you. I will be your best friend. And that we will walk together even into eternity. Indeed, Grandma was joyful and full of life. And even our presence today here, while it be solid, is not sad. This is a life well lived. A sinner redeemed by the Lord. A gift to each other and a gift to all that she met. Indeed, I shall miss her, even though I already have been. And I know you will as well. But you know, life doesn't end in death. For all of us carry our experiences and our remembrances with us. And so today may make us cry. But it is, it is not only because we are separated physically, these are joys, joyous tears, tears of joy. For when we love, as someone has mentioned, especially in the life of Thompson's, it seems just like the craziness that Jesus said. If you want to gain your life, give it up. And you will find love and life beyond your imagination. Or as someone has put it, the crazy thing about Jesus and those who follow him is that the more we love others, the more love is created. And what we thought was a limited resource has become like the main Ruth, filled to overflowing, refreshing, life-giving. And so we say goodbye. And we say it in the assembly of this church and this family. And most of all, we give thanks to her life, we give thanks for her gifts. And in some cases, we literally give thanks for our lives. Another child of God, given by God, and received in the embrace of God beyond death into eternal life. One who becomes now the cloud of witnesses that will go with us. Indeed, it is an end, but it's also a new beginning. Amen. Amen.